nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, and then shall the end come. Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Here's today's prophecy update. America finds itself in the middle of a heated presidential campaign. The Bible prophesies that these elections will soon be a thing of the past. Daniel 7 verse 9 foretells the end of human governments and the beginning of the kingdom of God on earth. Daniel said, I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the Ancient of Days did sit. The coming kingdom of God is foretold many times throughout the Bible. Jesus instructed his disciples to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Very soon now, we will not have to pray this prayer any longer since the establishment of the kingdom of God is just ahead. When Jesus establishes his kingdom, all wars will cease. There will not be one war for the next 1,000 years. Finally, it will be peace on earth and goodwill toward men. I want to talk to you today about the coming kingdom of God. We talk a lot here at End of the Age about the prophecies that are coming to pass all around us, leading us up to the kingdom of God. But today I'd like to talk about the kingdom of God. What's it going to be like? Where are we right now? In Revelation chapter number 11, verse number 15, it's recorded the seventh of the seven trumpets sounding. Here's what it says about the seventh and last trumpet. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. It's another look at the establishment of the kingdom of God upon this earth. It's foretold over and over and over. It is the theme of the prophets of the Old Testament and the apostles of the New Testament. When Jesus sent his disciples out to preach, he said, go heal the sick and preach the gospel of the kingdom. Or say to the people, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So what does all this mean? Well, in a nutshell, before we go to some more scripture, let me just put it in very plain human terms. The message of the kingdom of God simply states that mankind is being allowed to rule himself right now in order to learn that he can't. I think we're just about there. And once we reach that point where God determines, all right, mankind has learned that he cannot rule himself, that's when Jesus will come, put down the governments of men and establish his kingdom, a kingdom that will never pass away and never be destroyed. That's the message of the kingdom of God. And if you want to be a part of that kingdom, the kingdom is in formation right now. Now, the kingdom of God hasn't been established on earth yet, but it is being established right now in the hearts of men. The Bible says the kingdom of heaven is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, peace joy in the Holy Ghost. The Bible teaches us that except a person is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God and he cannot see the kingdom of God. So when a person is born again, that means experiencing a spiritual new birth. When that happens, 
Then comes righteousness, peace, joy, and a life of living in the Holy Ghost. Now, let's go now and look at some more scripture about the establishment of the kingdom of God. In Daniel chapter number seven, the first eight verses are devoted to Great Britain, the United States, Russia, Germany, and the countries of Europe in Bible prophecy. These are the nations that will be on the earth at the time of the second coming of Jesus, at which time he will, in fact, establish his kingdom on earth. So Daniel 7, 21 through 22 sort of gives us what happens right before the establishment of the kingdom. This is dealing with the Antichrist. Here's what it says. I beheld and the same horn, that's the Antichrist, made war with the saints and prevailed against them. This is talking about the time of the great tribulation. He goes on to say, he prevailed against them until the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Now the Bible tells us that the Antichrist is going to make war against the saints until Jesus comes. And when Jesus comes, the Antichrist and the false prophet are going to be cast into the lake of fire and the saints are going to be given the kingdom. The Bible teaches that we will rule and reign as kings and priests with Jesus Christ for 1,000 years. Now, continuing on in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, it ref goes back and talks more in more detail about the Antichrist. It says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, still is talking about the Antichrist, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. Now this is terminology for three and a half years. A time is one year, times is two years, and dividing of time is half of a year. Every single reference we have to the Great Tribulation says it lasts for three and a half years. This is one passage. Revelation 13, 5 says power was given unto the beast to continue 42 months, which of course is three and a half years. And then in Revelation chapter number 12, verse number 6, it says that the dragon, Satan, will make war against Israel for 1,260 days, which is three and a half years Every single reference to the Great Tribulation in Scripture, there's about six or seven of them, says it will last for three and one half years. So the Antichrist is going to make war against the saints for three and a half years. But verse 26 tells us, but the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. There was a place in scripture where Peter said to the Lord one day, he said, Lord, we've forsaken all to follow you. What are we going to get? And Jesus said, no one that has forsaken me will be unrewarded, but they will in fact receive a hundredfold in this life and eternal life in the life to come. But then Jesus said concerning his disciples, but you will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel all during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. So there's a lot in the Bible about the coming kingdom. Let me pause just a moment to say to all of you, you want to be in the kingdom. This is the reason you were put here on earth. There's no other explanation for the creation of mankind. Almighty God in the beginning foresaw a time when he would have a people that would rule and reign with him, be in partnership. As a matter of fact, the scriptures call the church the bride. Now, when he's king of kings, 
the church will be queen of queens. So we will rule and reign as, uh, with Jesus Christ as the queen and the bride of Jesus Christ. Now in Isaiah chapter number 2, verse 2 through 4, we get a glimpse of what it's going to be like after Jesus comes back, after he casts down the thrones of men and establishes his kingdom. Here's what it says. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. Now notice this. Almighty God, Jesus Christ, is going to judge among the nations and he's going to rebuke people that are not living properly. It goes ahead to say, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. No more need for military. No more need for weapons. They're going to beat their swords into plowshares. They're going to use plows to cultivate the soil. They're going to beat their spears into pruning hooks. And men will learn war no more. There's not going to be any military. There's not going to be any basic training. None of that's going to happen. There will be no need of it because Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. And he's going to come and teach us how to live in peace. Now, did you get it? Not one war, not one for 1,000 years. What a wonderful world that that's going to be. And you don't want to miss it. Now, in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 through 9, it tells us more about what the kingdom of God is actually going to be like. Listen to it. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. Now, Jesse was the father of David, and Jesus was the son of David. That's what this is referring to. So there's going to come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow up out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of the eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with right righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked and righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Now listen. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. Think about this. You look out in the yard, and there's a wolf lying down beside a lamb. And the leopard shall lie down with the kid, with the calf. Can you imagine a leopard and a calf out in the barnyard together? And the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. So lions aren't going to eat rabbits or any other animal, no deer. Instead, when Jesus comes... When the 1,000-year reign begins, there's going to be a transformation take place in the physical makeup 
of animals that have been carnivorous, that have been meat-eating animals, and now then the lion will eat straw like the ox, and the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now, what I'm talking about here is not 500 years away. It's not 100 years away. It could be as little as eight, nine, or 10 years away. I cannot give you the exact time today. But we are very close now. All of the signs that are to precede the second coming of Jesus, and it's at his second coming that he will establish his kingdom upon this earth. All of those signs are being fulfilled right now. We are going to see the second coming of Jesus and the establishment of his kingdom. What a day that will be. Now, how in the world is this going to happen? How are we going to have a world full of human beings, but a world with no war? Well, first of all, let me tell you this way. Not all human beings will be mortal beings. Most of them will be. However, when Jesus comes back to the earth, the Bible teaches that all of those that accepted his lordship voluntarily during this present age called the church age, all who heard the gospel of the kingdom of God and said, I want to be a part. All of those people, when Jesus comes back because they've obeyed the gospel, and the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection. If you don't know about that term gospel, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 4 in your Bible. It says there, the apostle Paul was writing, and he said, I have delivered you the gospel which I received, how the Christ died, was buried, and rose again the third day. So he said, I delivered you the gospel, and the gospel is the death of Christ, the burial of Christ, and the resurrection of Christ. Now that's the reason the gospel is called being born again, because Jesus did three things at Calvary. He died, he was buried, and he rose again. That's the reason the plan is called being born again. So when you're born again, you're a new creature. And the Bible says, except you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. But all those people who are born again, when Jesus comes back soon, the Bible says we are going to be changed from mortal beings to immortal beings. And then we will be caught up to meet Jesus in the air, just like Jesus was caught up from the Mount of Olives uh, 40 days after his resurrection. We're going to be caught up. And those people that have died and were born again and live in a Christian life when they died, they're going to come out of the graves and they'll be caught up together with us. All of us will have new bodies. We will have glorified bodies, immortal. Now, a mortal body can die. An immortal body cannot die. The Bible says that we don't know how we shall appear, but this we know, that when he appears... We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The Bible says we will have a body like unto his glorious body. So we're going to be caught up to meet him in the air. But here's the bigger question. What's going to transform the world from this world of wars and rumors of wars? I mean, it's, it's nonstop. It's incessant all the time. Will Russia attack Turkey? Uh, the, Turkey is attacking the Kurds. The United States is attacking ISIS. ISIS is trying to take over Libya. And it's never ending. So what's going to happen? What cataclysmic transformation is going to happen 
when Jesus comes back to this earth that's going to change everything? How are we going to go from nonstop war to no war? Well, the Bible tells us how to live at peace. Presently, we live under law. And you can't pass enough laws to make people be right. We have more laws than we've ever had and we have fuller prison than we've ever had. So what's the key to the transformation? Well, Jesus came not to teach us the law. The Bible says that he took the handwriting of ordinances which were against us out of the way, having nailed it to his cross. So the laws that no one can keep them all, Jesus Christ took away. And then he brought us principles instead of laws. Let me just give you a little example of some of the principles that Jesus came to teach. This is in the famous Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter number 5. I'm reading from verse 43. And ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Think about that. Love your enemy. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Now think about this. This is what Jesus taught us to do. If we're Christians, we're supposed to love our enemies. By the way, how are you doing? Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. When somebody gets mad at you, maybe they even cuss you out. They may shake their fist at you at the four-way stop when they think they were there before you. Do good to them that hate you. Have you ever had somebody hate you and you didn't even know why they hated you? Well, this is Jesus teaching us instead of you hate me, I'll hate you back. Uh, you do something bad to me, I'll try to do something bad back to you. Jesus said, no, that's not the way. The way that I want you to live is to love your enemies. Do good to those that do bad to you. Love those that hate you. Okay, so here's what I'm here to tell you today. I'm here to tell you that we're on the brink of the kingdom of God. Now, if you want to be a part of the kingdom of God, you need to be born again. And then after you're born again, you go into training. The Bible says we will rule and reign as kings and priests. Now, some people will rule over more than others. The Bible says the man who had a talent and gained 10, he would be ruler over 10 cities. To the one who had a talent and gained five, he would be ruler over five cities. So when we're in the kingdom of God, the level to which we grow will determine the level of our responsibilities during the kingdom of God on the earth. But the Bible teaches we will rule and reign as kings and priests and we will be here in order to teach the world how to live in peace. You know, we live in a time when there's so much marital turmoil. There's so much conflict between children and their parents. There's a generational gap. There's so much hatred between races. Let me pause just a moment to say to you out there, if you're a Christian, don't get involved in all of this racial conflict. Don't do it. Because the Bible says that if we have respect for persons, we commit sin. Now, I know I'm speaking from the South right now. I moved to Dallas 10 years ago. I haven't personally witnessed a lot of prejudice. Maybe it's here. Maybe I'm insulated from it. I don't know. I go to a wonderful church where we have everybody there. We have Koreans. We have Spanish. We have 
uh, African Americans, we have Nigerians, we have everybody. We have some Koreans, some Chinese, some French. We never mention it. We never mention it. It's a non-issue. You know, some people, their whole life is colored by racial problems. They see everything through the eyes of race. Let me tell you, everybody needs to drop that. Blacks need to drop it. Whites need to drop it. Anybody else, everybody else needs to drop it. Because the more you dig at that wound, the less time you give it to heal. Now, I understand it would be easy for someone to say, well, you don't know what it's like to have a great-grandmother that was a slave. And you're right. I don't know what that's like. All I know is it's wonderful to be in a church. I've been there 10 years. I have yet to hear the first mention of race, period. Doors wide open. Everybody's welcome. Never had a problem. Isn't that a wonderful way to live? And that's the way God wants us to live. I would to God that the next president of the United States, God would give him wisdom to be able to heal the horrible conflict among the races. And it's not a one-sided issue because, now let me tell you, there's no excuse for it. If you're white, I don't care what blacks do, there's no excuse for it. If you're black, I don't care what whites do, there's no excuse for it. Love your enemies, bless those that curse you. If everybody starts doing that, our racial problems are going to be over. And that's the reason when Jesus comes, it's going to be peace on earth, goodwill toward men. What a day that's going to be. This trip was a special experience for me. My study of the Bible has been enhanced after seeing Israel. The guides and planners for this trip did an excellent job of taking care of us. The hotels and furnished meals were top notch. This is a trip of a lifetime. Sign up and go. Bert from Arizona. Come with us as we walk in the footsteps of Jesus and learn about the end time story on our Israel Holy Roman Empire tour. The Bible prophesies that the Antichrist and false prophet will come out of the Holy Roman Empire. We will be touring the capital of the European Union in Brussels, Belgium, where the rebirthed Holy Roman Empire was fulfilled. We will also visit the Charlemagne Cathedral in Aachen, Germany, who was the first emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. We will be touring the Hall of the Caesars in Frankfurt, Germany, and much more. When we get to Israel, we will see the Mount of Olives, the Garden Tomb, the Temple Institute, Bethlehem, the Western Wall, the Sea of Galilee, the Mount of the Beatitudes, and more. Irvin and Judy hope you will come with them and experience the Israel Holy Roman Empire tour to share one of their favorite places on earth with you. Call 1-800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com for more information. If your radio station only carries the first 30 minutes of End of the Age, go to endtime.com to continue to listen to today's broadcast. We are taking your calls in this segment of the program. The number to call to be on the air with me, 877-END-TIME, 877-363-8463. If you'd like to reach our operators, perhaps you've been thinking about becoming a partner with End Time Ministries, but you haven't done it yet. Well, don't wait any longer. We need your strength because all of us together are strong. The Bible says a threefold cord is not easily broken. And when we join together, we can do much more than we can do alone. So if you'd like to be a partner with us, please call right now, 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463. To be on the air with me, 
time. I want to go to the phones right now. Tony is calling from Michigan. Hello, Tony. Hey, doctor, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing wonderful. Thank you very much. Hey, it's really great to talk to you, doctor. God bless you continuously in your health and your ministry. Thank you. Hey, um, I want to make a comment about this war, this Euphrates River War, and uh, uh, like you've been talking about, it, it probably most likely is going to, well, it's going to have to be a nuclear war. But uh, the thing that we need to understand about this war is it's going to be more than a nuclear war. It's going to be a thermal nuclear war which is a lot different than, than what we saw happen in Japan. And the very nature of a thermal nuclear weapon is that it is a first strike weapon because most of these nations are not going to be able to absorb a hit from one of these nations and be able to retaliate. So I guess I wanted to bring that up because this war is not going to be something that's going to be discussed in the media or CNN or anything like those, uh, like, like these wars are normally advertised. What's going to probably happen is that all of a sudden it's just going to happen without a warning. And, uh, you know, we can see this war coming in the, in the, in the pages of the book. But to sit and expect that there's going to be a discussion and then, and, and then all of a sudden we're normally at war with the nation is probably not the way that this war is going to get started. So I want to bring that point up. Uh, and uh, my second uh, uh, question, I guess is a question, is regarding Matthew 24. Uh, because the disciples coming out of the temple uh, asked the question of Jesus that we all think about today. And, and, and I imagine none of us would have ever imagined that we'd be staring down the barrel of this war, which could, who knows when it's going to happen, this week, next week, next year, whatever. Um, but the answer that Jesus gave to the disciples seems to be applicable to our very day because, uh, pardon me, because the conditions that are going to be on the earth after the Euphrates War, seems to be, it seems to be what Jesus was talking about. Because there's going to be, there's going to be famines, there's going to be earthquakes, there's going to be co people coming out talking about Jesus Christ, and they're going to. Be, so, I mean, they asked the question, but it seems like his answer was directed di is specifically to us of this day. And that's all I want to say. I want to get your comments on that, and thank you so much for. Uh, being the ministry that you are. Well, thank Great. you very much, Tony. And uh, we do know that World War III is coming. And the astonishing thing is, if you read the description of the Six Trumpet War there in Revelation 9, verse 13 through 16, actually it's verse 13 through 21, but the nuts and bolts of the prophecy are verses 13 through 16. And it simply states this war will start from the Euphrates River. Well, we have all kinds of armies gathered up and down the Euphrates today. As a matter of fact, uh, I just was looking at an article. This comes from the EU foreign minister, Mogherini. And the statement says, war between Russia and Turkey could be on the horizon. Russia is amassing troops right along the Turkish border right now. Turkey shot down a Russian plane uh, just a few weeks ago, and Russia has not yet retaliated. But the point is this. We do have a sense of timing. Uh, we know for certain that the war has to happen before the final three and a half years, and we know the final three and a half years begins in verse number 15. When Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. So we know that, that the abomination of desolation happens halfway through the final seven years. And we can prove, if you go back to Revelation chapter number 9, you have the sixth trumpet war in chapter 9. In chapter 10, you have the beginning of the final three and a half years. You have an angel standing, one foot on the land, one foot on the water, his hand raised to heaven, declaring that delay shall be no longer. 
And then immediately we move into chapter 11, which is devoted completely to the final three and a half years. The first two verses of chapter 11, John was told, uh, Arise, measure the temple and those that worship therein. But the outer court of the temple, leave out and don't measure it because it's going to be trodden down for the next 42 months. So verses 1 and 2 of chapter 11 talk about the final 42 months. And then verse 3 says, And I will send my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days, which again is 42 months. That's three and a half years. So the entire 11th chapter is devoted to the final three and a half years, culminating with verse number 15 when it says, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. So what, what, what's the point? The point is that we've got this war that's going to start from the Euphrates River. It has to happen before the final three and a half years. That much we know. Now, when you think about a war that wipes out one-third of the human race, what kind of chaos is this going to produce? I mean, it's going to produce chaos so incredible. Uh, like you mentioned, uh, the hydrogen bomb that Korea claims to have tested recently is 1,000 times as powerful as the atomic bomb that was used at Hiroshima. That's almost inconceivable because that bomb at Hiroshima killed 160,000. One nuclear bomb. Now multiply that by a thousand times. You could wipe out Los Angeles with one bomb. You could wipe out New York City with one bomb. So there are horrible wars coming. That is true. And it looks like we're approaching that time. Now, I've said many times on this program that there are two major events that are prophesied for the near future. One is the Sixth Trumpet War. The other is the signing of a Middle East peace agreement, which then will trigger the final seven years. And both of those things happen so close together in prophecy that I can't tell you for sure which one comes first. But I know for positive that the war, the Euphrates River War, has to happen the latest before the final three and a half years because that's the way it's depicted in Scripture. You've got the war, then you've got the uh, man standing one foot on the land, one foot on the sea, declaring that delay shall be no longer. The final three and a half years begins. The exact same order is in Daniel chapter number 12 when Michael stands up for his people and it says, and then shall be a time of trouble such as never has been before. And then they ask, how long till the end of these wonders? And he said, until a time, times, half a time. That's three and a half years. So it's very consistent. The only question is, where are we today? And I cannot answer that. I will be shocked if we're not within the final 10 years right now. I know for certain that the final seven years have not begun yet. So we could very well be within about a three or four or five year window. And again, don't hold me to this because I cannot tell you. All I know is there's a seven year period that will begin with a peace agreement in Israel between the Israel and the Palestinians. There's going to be a Palestinian state created and the Temple Mount is going to be placed under a share arrangement. I just stood on the Temple Mount just two days ago. I was in Israel. And we were the first film crew in a year and a half that has been allowed to film on the Temple Mount. We also were allowed to go inside the Dome of the Rock. I used to go there every year uh, until the year 2000 when the Second Intifada broke out. And then they stopped it. But we went in yesterday. I hadn't been in there for 16 years. Walked around. Saw the uh, Muslim women in groups of 5, 8, 10 studying together. Uh, saw people kneeling, praying, both men and women, facing Mecca. Saw the big foundation stone, 12 feet wide and uh, 32 feet long. Uh, inside the beautiful, it's beautiful inside there. It's, it's ornate, it's beautiful. Uh, but the point is, we were there and I stood on the site that it's almost certain the temple's going to be built on shortly. I stood at the Dome of the Spirits 
and I revisited Revelation chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. So the scriptures were right there, right now. The only thing we don't know, we're, we're before the final seven years. We don't know whether we're eight years, nine years, ten years. To go beyond that, it could. 11, 12, I can't tell you for sure. But it looks like it's sooner rather than later. And so consequently, uh, and when it says there will be wars and rumors of wars, uh, the sixth trumpet war would be included in that there in Matthew 24. Uh, once you hit verse number 15, you're now in the final three and a half years. Because once Jesus mentioned the abomination of desolation, he said, when you see the abomination of desolation, then let those who be, be in Judea flee. That's the Jews who stay in Judea once it's turned over to the Palestinians. Oh, by the way, I learned something while I was in Israel this time. A lot of people go out there in the settlements and they buy properties because property is so ridiculously high. A thousand square foot apartment can be close to a million dollars. It's ridiculous. The expense of property there. So a lot of people go out among the settlers because it's much cheaper because uh, it's more dangerous and there's not as much security. But when they go out there now, they have to sign a paper with the government that if they're ever forced to leave, that the government doesn't owe them anything. Which, when I heard that, it dawned on me, look, no wonder a lot of these Jews are going to stay because they have no place to go. And apparently the government's told them, we're not buying you out. Now, a lot of people said that the United Nations or the United States or Israel would be paying reparations for those people to leave. But what I just learned is now the new people that are going out there are being told, look, if you go out there, you build at your own risk. And if war happens, if we pull out of there, the government's not responsible. So Again, you can understand why the people would end up taking a chance and staying under the new Palestinian government. Well, anyway, interesting. Um, let me see. We're up against the break. If you're on hold, stay right there. We do have open lines, and I'm going to call 877 end time. You're listening to End of the Age, and we've been talking today about the coming kingdom of God, which is just ahead of us right now, right around the corner. If you're not ready for it, get ready. The way to get ready is to be born again. And we'll talk more about that in our ne next segment of our program. Study prophecy wherever you go with End Times audio downloads. Listen to one-hour lessons like Will Islam Rule the World or Seeds of Armageddon for just $4.99. Let your imagination and your understanding of prophecy dive into the end time novels like China War in the Third Temple and Dark Intentions written by Irvin Baxter. Maybe you feel bombarded by what's going on in the news and you want to just hear some good old-fashioned preaching. We have tons of sermons taught by Irvin that are rich in truth. You can go through our entire Understanding the End Time series while driving to work, cooking dinner, or wherever your busy day takes you. Let our audio library accompany you by going to endtime.com slash store and click the audio downloads. Jesus said that there would be a particular generation that would see specific things take place. And this would be the people that would see his second coming to the earth. The big question is, can we know this generation? Jesus talked about it in Matthew 24. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and put out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, you know that he is near, at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Jesus said, when you see these things, what things was he talking about? In the DVD, This Generation Shall Not Pass, Irvin discusses the events that must occur that will let us know the generation that shall not pass until the second coming of Jesus Christ. Get this enlightening lesson by calling 1-800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com.
By the way, I want to tell all of you that attended our prophecy conference. What was it? Two weeks ago now on Tuesday night. Fabulous turnout, full house, just a tremendous conference. I hope it was a blessing to you. Thank you for being there. I think it probably was a blessing to all of us to realize how everything's going to unfold between here and the Battle of Armageddon. Nevertheless, great response. I flew out the next day for Israel. Uh, we are helping to make a film. When that film was ready, we're hoping to make it available to you in one form or another. We don't know exactly how that's going to work. It's being produced by a company out of Australia, but it, I think it's going to be fabulous. So anyway, we'll let you know when that time comes. Uh, been very, very busy. Just flew in late last night from Israel. So I uh, haven't had a lot of time to do a lot of things, but I just, just wanted to thank all of you for attending. It was an incredible, uh, successful conference. Uh, we had a wonderful time together. Let's get right back to our uh, phones now. Catherine is calling from right here in Texas. Hello, Catherine. Hello, Brother Baxter. Uh, I was in prayer uh, earlier, and it felt uh, it was pressed upon me to call you about the mark of the beast. Okay. And it says that back and and what the Lord felt I felt the Lord was saying to me is back in the 70s or early 80s there was a book that had came out that was talking about barcodes on uh, products and that they were connecting the 666 to a barcode. Well, what the Lord prompted me to tell you is that and it is based on that they they were on the right track but they fell short and it is related to the computer. And it uh, all because the computer these days contains all of our information. All the phones are connected. Everything is connected. And he said that you're right. It uh, is going to be going under the skin, and the eye scans are going to be for those who refuse their shot. Uh, and this could be smaller children, you know, older people. And it says that. And he said that uh, it's it's going to be starting to implement very very soon. That they're already practicing it, and it's on the news and that everybody needs to be aware and to listen to you and to take heed on this mark of the beast because he says you cannot get into heaven if you have this mark and you don't understand what it pertains to. And uh, that's just about all he told me to tell you. So I just needed to call and tell you that. Okay, Catherine, I appreciate it. And uh, thank you very much. I'm going to let you go. But let me go to the scripture that Catherine's referring to here. This is... Revelation chapter number 13, verse 16. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. Some translations says, say, let him that hath understanding calculate the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and six. Another passage says it's the number of the name of a man. So we don't know exactly the form that the mark of the beast is going to take, but it is going to be used to freeze people out economically and to force people to pledge allegiance to the Antichrist and his one world government and his one world religion. So uh, it is coming. It's coming very rapidly now. Uh, but let me tell you, if you listen to this program, you're not going to be taken unawares. I have a lot of people say, well, could I accidentally take the mark of the beast? And I just tell them, not if you listen to End of the Age because we're going to be screaming from the housetop. Now, you can't take the mark of the beast today. You can't do it because you have to worship the Antichrist in order to do it. And the Antichrist has not yet been revealed. The mark of the beast will be implemented during the final three and a half years. Now, when this peace agreement is signed between Israel and the Palestinians, that's going to trigger the final seven years. That first three and a half years, we're going to be preaching to the world. Three and a half years from now, the mark of the beast is coming. 
you better get close to God. The Bible says all will worship the beast except those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. If you want the power to resist the pressure toward the mark of the beast, you need to be filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not talking about signing a card and becoming a member of a church by shaking a preacher's hand. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about real Christianity. I'm talking about people that live like the early church lived, like the apostles lived, on fire for God. That's what I'm talking about, and that's what it's going to take. Well, God's going to help us. Let's get back to the phones now. John is calling from Louisiana. Hello, John. Thank you for taking my call, Brother Baxter. Uh, can you speak up louder, John? Thanks for taking my call, Brother Baxter. Uh, yes, you're welcome. What's on your mind? Isaiah chapter 66, there's several references there that uh, lead me to believe that it's um, a prophecy that kind of dovetails with Ezekiel chapter 38. Uh, in several verses, it talks about the Lord uh, making his appearing in a whirlwind, um, fire with a sword. Verse 19 speaks of Tubal. Uh, verse 22 speaks of new heavens and new earth. Just wanted to see if you thought those uh, two passages um, um, dovetailed together. Well, uh, I think... I certainly think so. It's been a while since I've been down that road there, uh, John, but I certainly think so just at first glance because uh, it refers to, and they shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto the Lord out of all the nations, horses and chariots, and right. to my holy mountain in Jerusalem. So it certainly is referring to that time and it's referring to the kingdom of God. And of course, it's on topic today. And I thank you for bringing that up. Uh, for people that don't know off the top of their head, Ezekiel 37 talks about the rebirth of the nation of Israel. And then in verse 38, it talks about uh, the battle of Armageddon, also in verse, uh, or chapter 38 and also chapter 39. In chapter 37, that's given to the rebirth of Israel. Chapter 38 and 39 is the battle of Armageddon. So this passage, Isaiah 66, appears to be talking about the establishment of the millennium. Of course, we read several scriptures about that already. But yes, I do, John, believe that. One follow-up with you, if you, if you could. Sure. Verse 24 talks about the worm shall not die, uh, fire be not quenched, uh, and then uh, if I jump back to verse 12, it speaks of the glory of the Gentiles. When Isaiah received this word from the Lord, I, I bet it quite surprised him and others that read his works later on, uh, thinking of Gentiles as dogs and the Lord referencing the Gentiles, the glory of the Gentiles. So just uh, interesting stuff how it all comes around. Well, it is. Of course, the scriptures are absolutely filled with things like this. And I would tell everybody out there, I remember when I was a kid, uh, they would always preach about the Jews being the chosen people. And I remember thinking, man, I wish I could have been born a Jew. I would right. be a chosen a person. And I didn't have an understanding back in those days. But when you're born again, you become a true Jew. The Bible tells us that... Uh, when a person is born again, they become the spiritual seed of Abraham and spiritual seed is better than being physical seed. Now you can be a double Jew if you're physically born a Jew in that you can be both a physical Jew and be born again and be a spiritual Jew. But the Bible tells us that if we have the faith of Abraham, that we are the children of Abraham. Uh, so consequently, uh, the Bible tells us that Jesus broke down the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile, making no difference. Today, a lot of people try to say, well, America is uh, Manasseh and Eph uh, Great Britain is Ephraim. It don't matter because That's there's right. one plan of salvation for everyone. Amen. The message for all of us is you must be born again. Yes. And when we say you must be born again, we should say you get to be born again. It's not a matter of uh, something that's to be avoided. It's a wonderful privilege to embrace. So uh, uh, thank you a lot, John. Let me we get, love you. Take care. Uh, let me let you go. And I got one more call I want to get in here. Uh, calling from, I don't know whether it's Alaska or Arkansas. I think it's uh, Arkansas. Pat. Hello, Pat. 
Please, sir. I'm in uh, Alaska. I'm in Fairbanks, oh. Alaska. Okay. Well. God bless you and your ministry. I listen all the time, and I've learned so much. But here's a question I've never had a real-world answer to. All right. Now, when it comes to women witnessing and the Bible saying, let your women keep silent in the church, I'm perfectly fine with that. I'm happy with the scriptures that say this is what a minister and a preacher and a teacher should be. And I've seen a couple of women TV preachers come and go. I know one of them, her show went off the air because she went to jail. And another female preacher, she was divorced and her show went off the air. So to me, women um, in the pulpit, women uh, waving their arms and carrying on as though the Lord has anointed them to actually preach. Um, I think that is <laughs> an abomination. And yet we're all supposed to be witnessing, and I have tried that in the workplace. And the people who don't want Jesus, to me, they're possessed by the devil. Uh, listen, listen Pat, I, Pat, I'm almost out of time, so let me just real quickly respond to you. I hate to cut you off, but we're just about out of time. Let me just quickly respond. You know, the Bible teaches, let everything that hath breath praise ye the Lord. So it's certainly in order for women to praise the Lord. The Bible says that Philip had four daughters that were prophetesses, and they prophesied. Uh, so to, for women to be dead silent and to never utter a peep, uh, that's not what this passage means. However, that we don't want to disannul the passage either because it's God's Word. And the Bible says, I suffer not a woman to teach or usurp authority over a man. Another passage instructs the older women to teach the younger women. So we've got to take all the scriptures together to get the big picture. It's not God's will for women to exercise authority over men in a masculine way. I've seen God use some women in a good way. I've also seen some women that were horribly out of place. Uh, so consequently, God does use women. They can be prophetesses and they can do different things, but there are some things that God never intended for women to do. Uh, God made male and female and said it's good. Men are supposed to do some things. Women are supposed to do some things. And when we have everything in its proper order, it is wonderful. And that's the way it should be. Uh, Got to let you go, Pat. Thank you very much for calling because we are out of time. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in once again today. I'd like to invite you one more time. Become a partner with End Time Ministries. We've got so much to do and so little time to do it in. Uh, to become a partner, call 1-800-END-TIME. If you'd like a free copy of our What Do You Mean Born Again brochure, go to endtime.com. Halfway down the page, click on it. There it is. God bless you all. See you tomorrow. is a production of End Time Ministries. This broadcast will be available on our website, endtime.com, in the archive section. On our website, you'll also find more information about how current events are fulfilling Bible prophecy. To reach our operators, call 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463. End Time Ministries is partner-supported. We would like to say thank you to our partners who made this broadcast possible. To do what Matthew 24, 14 said, to reach the world with the gospel of the kingdom.